You don't need me to tell you that we're approaching a subject that will certainly generate interest, might even generate a bit of discussion, and quite possibly might even generate some disagreement. If you disagree with what I say this evening, I would ask you to bear in mind that I'll be as gracious with my presentation as I can, and I'll depend on you and the grace of God to return the compliment as you disagree with me. What I want to do this evening, rather than just dive straight into the subject of election from a biblical point of view, we'll do that in the later part of the meeting, but what I want to do firstly is give to you just a little of my own history in relation to the grand subject of election. And if, as I do that, if you listen carefully, I think you might find it interesting just to follow the footsteps of one who was seeking for the truth in relation to the subject. Why do I say that? I was brought up in an assembly, never knew anything else in my whole experience. My father was uh, an overseer in the assembly before I was born. And I was brought up with the teaching of election as presented by most assembly teachers under the analogies of either two railway lines that run parallel out into eternity, or else two sides of the one door. On the one side of the door is whosoever will, and on the other side when you come in you look up and you see you act according to the foreknowledge of God. That was the staple diet as far as election was concerned in my formative years in relation to the truth of God. Now there's a problem with that. And there's a big problem with that subject, or with that approach to the subject, which I hope to show later. But the big problem, I'll state now and I'll explain it later in case I run out of time, but the big problem with that is that what we are doing is we are taking two parallel lines and we're saying that one line says God chose me to be saved. And the other line says that I exercise my free will. The, night, the two of them will never ever be reconciled. But, says the person with that view, they don't need to be reconciled. They can't be reconciled in the mind of a finite human, but they are reconciled in the infinite mind of God. Well, the difficulty with that is that nowhere in my Bible, and nowhere in your Bible, will you find it stated anywhere that God chose you to be saved. That's the difficulty. One of the railway lines is out of order already and the train is off the track before we get started. But I'm going to develop that maybe a little bit uh, later on. As a young believer with those views, the two railway lines and the two sides of the door, firmly implanted in my mind, as a young believer I came into contact with other believers in my employment who were strongly reformed in their theology or strongly Calvinistic. I became very interested in their view of election because as I listened to them and as they put it to me, it, it all seemed to make sense. It seemed to fit together. It seemed to be an integrated argument, if you like, where A came before B came before C and everything fitted logically together and it suited the type of mind that I had. Now, I hadn't enough experience and maturity to know that that was a big problem with it that it did suit the type of mind that I have. And now as I look back, that's one of the first warning signs that I would always give to a person who has imbibed Calvinism in any shape or form. And to any strength or to any degree, if you've been affected by it, always remember this, that it is a system that is very appealing to the analytical, logical mind. That interest that I had deepened and I was and still am an avid reader. And I became interested in the, in the ideas and I was introduced to the writings of the Puritans. I was introduced to the Banner of Truth publishing house. And I gathered all that I could that helped me to understand this particular view of election. And I piled my shells as a young believer. That's what I spent most of my pocket money on. Getting books that would help me to understand this particular slant in election. The early Puritan writers, I had men like Stephen Sharnock, The Attributes of God, a multi-volume set. I had Owen, John Owen, I had Richard Baxter, I had Thomas Manton. And as I read those men, I didn't understand much of their English, I can tell you, because they wrote in another kind of world of English, but yet I was able to follow their arguments, and that I did. Then I got the hold of some later Reformed writers because they were easier to follow. I had Bettner. I had J.I. Packer, I had Hodge, 
I had Berkhoff, I had Bavink, I had all of these men because they were the men who could expound and set forth this particular view of election. And I loved it. And I thought the arguments that they presented were unassailable. I thought it presented a watertight case for election to salvation and reprobation to damnation as the other side of the coin. And if anybody tells you that they believe election to salvation, but they do not believe reprobation to damnation, it only shows that they haven't read the argument and they don't know it. As I read it, my interest deepened. But then, as time went on, I became aware of the fact that some of these stronger Reformed theologians, as I call them, some of the men who gave you Reformed theology in its purest essence, as I read them, and then I would lift books of other more moderate Calvinists like C.H. Spurgeon and men like that. I discovered that these two men didn't agree. I discovered that men like Spurgeon and some assembly writers were taking the, the, the ideas of the pure, the purists, the reformed theologians, and they were watering it down. And you know what I discovered? They were just taking unadulterated Calvinistic reformed teaching, and they were watering it down to a dose just compatible with their assembly conscience. That's what they were doing. Just watering it down enough. To make it that they weren't embarrassed. By what they taught. Well. I began to wonder. Why should there be a difference? Why should there be a difference between. What some of the moderate Calvinists taught. And some of the. Strictest Calvinists taught. I began to wonder. That contradiction registered with me. But it lurked in my mind. As a kind of an uneasiness. For quite a number of years. Then I began to take those lingering doubts seriously. And I set myself to examine what I held. And I discovered that the system of theology that I thought that was unassailable. That the system and the doctrines of salvation that I thought were watertight. And invincible in their logic. I discovered that that just wasn't the case. They weren't as watertight as they first appeared. One of the first discoveries that I made as I began to investigate it was that the whole system of reformed theology was built upon principles of philosophy rather than principles of the word of God, rather than the pure exegesis of Holy Scripture. I discovered that these men were dealing really with a, a form, an art, of a form of philosophy. <coughs> I then began to look at the history of that philosophy and what I discovered really unsettled me. What I discovered at times really shocked me because that system of philosophy upon which Reformed theology was built takes its roots, or you can trace its roots right away back into AD 34 or a man who was born in AD 34, 354, sorry. His name is Augustine, called by some Saint Augustine of Hippo. And the roots of Reformed theology go back into the philosophy and the writings of that man. You know what shocked me? When I began to get interest, well, this man must have been a great thinker, I thought. I'll, I'll gather what I can on the life of St. Augustine. I'll find out what I can about him. I read some commendable things about him. But as I read, I discovered that his ideas were to lay the basis for what is now the Roman Catholic Church system. His ideas and his philosophy, his philosophical principles, were to lay the basis for the next 1,000 years, largely speaking, of church history and how men would think. When I began to see what sort of a man he was and what came from his pen, I of course began to question it. And I thought I'd dig a little bit deeper and find out more about him personally. And I discovered that before he professed to be a Christian, before he said that he converted to Christianity, if he ever did, but before that event took place that he calls his conversion to Christianity, he was very strongly influenced in his early life by an obscure sect, a Gnostic sect, called the Manichees. They were an Eastern sect, and without going into a lot of detail, I'd give you four of their basic tenets of philosophy. Four of their founding principles. And when I give them to you, you'll see immediately the parallel in what comes from the pen of Augustine. Right down the years from Augustine, right down to current, present day, reformed theologians 
you'll find these principles are operating. Number one, first of the principles of the Manichees was that their system of thought, as they called it, was not an alternative to Christianity, but it was an advanced form of it. That's the first thing. They said that, number two, that the faith that they taught was only for those who are spiritually mature. They said, number three, that the belief system that they taught was only for the intellectually gifted. And they said, number four, when in fact they practiced it, that their members, the members of the Manichees, the members of this Gnostic sect, what they did was they divided themselves into two groups. There were those who were known as learners, initiates, those who first were introduced to the system of thought. And then as they progressed in their spiritual apprehension, as they progressed with their intellectual gifts and abilities to apprehend these great truths, they then become known as the elect. Do you not see that replicated around us today? Because every one of those traits is found in Reformed theology. It presents itself as an advanced system of belief that is accessible only to the spiritually mature. It caters for the segregation of ourselves as the elect. And in spite of all the protests of supposed humility and pandering to, pandering to spiritual elitism is what it really does. Men may claim to talk about the grace of God, but it's always sovereign grace with its own meaning. It's not the grace, the pure, unadulterated grace of God as we have in our Bible. It's always called sovereign grace. And that has its own connotation. That has its own emphasis. That brings its own weight. And that introduces to the minds of those who hear it. Well, really, if I, I'm not going to do it, but if I was going to ask you, what is sovereign grace? Would you know? You might talk to me about the grace of God who is sovereign. You might even go a stage further and talk about God who is sovereign, able to do what he will, where he when, where he will, when he will, with whoever he will, for whatever purpose he will. And that's almost a classic reformed definition of sovereignty. But beyond that, you might not be able to go unless, and I hope there's nobody can go further than that. Because if you can go further than that in defining sovereign grace, you have been drinking at the well of Reformed theology. The strange thing about it is this. That the Manichees who had this very, very elitist approach to doctrine and philosophy. They were also devoted to Zoroastrianism which is really a, a form of paganism, Gnostic paganism. And they also had taints of Buddhism in their theology. Now that is what affected Augustine. That is what affected the man who would later pen philosophical principles that would be taken up later by reformers and come down the line right down to us in 2007. A man whose mind was steeped in Gnostic paganism. Now, there's a lot of other things about Augustine that might be interesting. I'll mention one or two of them. I read a book today I was just refreshing my mind. A book by an assembly writer who claims that his book is a defense of the doctrine of substitution and sovereignty. And as I read it, I became more and more alarmed. Because one of the claims is that what we believe in relation to whether it's the two railway lines or the two sides of the door or a Calvinistic portrayal of the doctrine of election, what we believe is what is taught, has been taught by the early brethren and has been taught for generations. Well, it has been. And it has been taught for longer than the early brethren. It has been taught for the reformers long before the early brethren were on the scene. And it was taught before that by Augustine. But the notable thing is this, that there are other doctrines that have equal ancient status as these things. One of them, the doctrine of purgatory. It's as old as Augustine, from whom come these principles of philosophy and theology. The doctrine of the worship of Mary. It's as old as Augustine, from whose pen it came, along with the doctrine of election and determinism. 
So ancient is also regeneration by baptism, baptismal regeneration. That came from the mind of this great, so-called great man Augustine. That's the well from which some men have been drinking. That's the truth that some men want to defend. Truth that has been drawn out from a well that to me has been so polluted. Then another thing that I discovered as I began my personal quest to find the truth. I discovered as I read the books of these reformed theologians. That there were liberal quotations of Holy Scripture. Always plenty of references but what I found out was that so very many of them, so very many of them had been taken completely out of their context, especially completely out of their dispensational context, because it is a truth that most Reformed theologians are also amillennialists. And they have no conception of the truth of the church as a unique entity, as something distinct from Israel, and something distinct from the, the covenant theology that they hold. That is another of the difficulties. And I noted all these things in my mind. And with that, and with those discoveries, I pledged that I would get myself away from the writings of these men that I treasured and that I had spent so much money on. And that I would get down to discover what the Bible really told. Well, as I began to do that, the next discovery I made was that just because one is not a Calvinist doesn't make him an Arminian. And just because one is not an Arminian doesn't make him a Calvinist. But yet, at the same time, having said that, at the same time, there is no point in me getting on a platform and coming off with classic Calvinistic statements that are straight from Calvinistic textbooks and professing not to be affected by Calvinistic doctrine. That's like a man living in Spain with a Spanish passport, getting up and speaking in Spanish, and then saying, I'm sorry, I'm not a Spaniard. It just is about the same amount of sense. So let's try and get away from the ideas of men, and let's just reserve our thoughts for the Word of God. Why do I say that? Well, you see, there are some... And I talked about men watering down Reformed theology and Calvinism. That has been done to a certain extent. Some men... You will know that Calvinism... Or the reformed aspect of teaching in relation to the doctrine of salvation. It appears under the mnemonic tulip. T-U-L-I-P. Each one standing for a different truth. Or error. Total depravity of man. Unconditional election. Limited atonement. Irresistible grace and perseverance of the saints. Now I, and I'm going to say this and I have no hesitation in saying it. I have no hesitation whatever in saying publicly. And I've said it in other places, so I'm at liberty to say it here. That I do not agree or subscribe to any of the five points of Calvinism. I do not agree with total depravity. I agree that man is totally depraved, but not the total depravity of man as taught by Calvinistic theologians. I believe in the election by God, but not in unconditional election as taught by Calvinistic theologians. I believe in the grace of God working. If it wasn't for the grace of God in any person's life, they never ever would obtain God's salvation. But I do not believe in irresistible grace. I certainly believe in atonement, but I don't believe in limited atonement. I believe in the eternal security of the saints. All says you, I, I agree with the Calvinists in that. Well, I don't. The perseverance of the saints is not synonymous with eternal security. You see, there are some brethren who will say, well, I can, I can be a four-point Calvinist. I don't agree with limited atonement. And they will go immediately to the easiest one as they think. Perseverance of the saints, I can agree with that. Well, you can't. Because if you read the Calvinistic theologians, you know what you discover? That they're more Arminian in their viewpoint than Arminius himself was. Perseverance of the saints doesn't mean eternal security. That is eternal life once and for all received, never to be lost. That is not perseverance of the saints. And for any assembly believer to tell me that they are a four-point Calvinist is no better than saying that they're a five-point Calvinist. In fact, it's worse. Because if they only had read the doctrine of Calvinism, if they only had read the textbooks properly, they would discover that Calvinism itself states, John Calvin stated it himself, that you've got to accept the whole five of the, the tenets for the system to work. So in his mind, the man whose name 
it carries. He had no doubt in his mind that there could never be such a thing as a four-point Calvinist. Another thing that I'm going to say, and I've proven this in my experience in South Africa, if you take a new convert, someone recently saved, who's had no exposure whatever to Reformed teaching, has only listened to a biblical gospel, and they have an interest in studying their Bible, if left only to his Bible, he will never, ever arrive at the conclusions of Reformed theology in relation to the doctrine of election or any of the other of his aberrations. Now I have proven that again and again and experience on the mission field with young men saved with an interest in studying their Bible who had no exposure to the doctrine of election as presented by Reformed theologians and get them to work on the subject in their Bible and they will never ever arrive at the doctrine of unconditional election as presented by the Calvinists. Well, what is this unconditional election? What is this that you're hammering against as you? Well, unconditional election as presented by the Calvinists say that God has unconditionally elected certain individuals out of the mass of humanity. God has individually elected or chosen certain individuals to be saved. And they will be saved. Irrespective of their design in life, irrespective of the decisions they may make, they will ultimately be saved. That's the doctrine of unconditional election that you'll have gathered by now I'm not very fond of. Then, some brethren when asked about the two railway line theory or the two sides of the door, and asked one or two pertinent questions. They very quickly retreat to Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29 and with very solemn tone they will tell us that the secret things belong unto the Lord our God but those things that are revealed belong unto us and to our children. In other words there are things that God has chosen to reveal and they're for us and for our children. Enjoy them. But there are things that are secrets. They belong unto God. In other words don't you pry where you're not entitled to pry. Well Deuteronomy 29 is true. That, that, is, that is the biblical truth. But that doesn't refer to the doctrine of election. Because when we come to the doctrine of election, what they seem to ignore is this. It is the great fact that what all the disagreement about is what has been revealed in Holy Scripture. It's what has been revealed to us. It's for us and to our children. That's where the disagreement lies, not in relation to the secret things which belong unto the Lord. There is no doubt, there is no doubt that in the heart of our God there are secrets. That's not the point. But it is not acceptable for Reformed theologians or those who have read them to try and identify what God has not revealed. What secret? And at the same time to try and mystify what has been revealed and to cloud it and to make it difficult to understand. What I'm saying is this. The subject of election is a thoroughly biblical subject. I have read you three verses this evening. One that picks out the noun for election. One that picks out the verb. And one that picks out the adjective. And that's the way that we're going to approach the subject this evening. By looking just at the biblical data in relation to the subject. Now bear in mind as we look at these verses. God gave them by divine inspiration. Why did he give them? To confuse us? Not at all. God gave it. That we might understand something of the heart of our God. That we might understand something of the greatness of God. Now however difficult, and, and election is a difficult subject. Not because of the biblical data, but because of the massive weight of debate that has gone on over the years. And it would be highly presumptuous of any individual let alone the one who is presently before you to stand on the platform and tell you he has all the answers. That's, that's not what I'm doing. What I'm asking you to do is leave aside all of the reformed textbooks and just get down to the Bible and ask yourself what is God saying? And remember what God is saying. God intended us to understand it. That's why he wrote it. Now it's a difficult subject, I know that. But it's about the eternal one. And it's about the workings of eternal purpose. And it's about the choices of the heart of God. And God has chosen to reveal to us in Holy Scripture. Therefore, with the help of the Spirit of God, we should be able to understand something about the great subject. 
Now, when it comes to telling you what I believe about it, I respect the right of others to hold a totally different view. But I expect that with godly graciousness, they will afford to me the same privilege. I have, again, as I say, I have, I have read some of the writings of those who have taken on them to write concerning this great subject. And it's very unbecoming to write in a scathing or a scornful or an abusive way of others when handling the word of God. I accept there are brethren who hold a totally different view to what I hold. That is their privilege to do. I would trust they'll afford me the same right. Now, what I want to do for the remaining minutes of the meeting is to look at the biblical data in relation to the subject. There are various parts of speech. Now, what I am doing now is the first time I have done it in a meeting publicly. I have never heard anyone else do it. I have never seen it written anywhere. That's just to look at the, the biblical data, the various parts of speech that are used in relation to the subject. And yet, it's the most basic exercise that you can undertake. To understand what the Bible says is just to get a pen and paper and write it down, get the data down on paper. What does the Bible say? Now, I said to you, I read to you at the start the three different portions. And we're going to use this format from now to the end of the meeting. We're going to look at the nouns that God by the Spirit has used in relation to the subject of election. We're going to look at the adjectives and we're going to look at the verbs. Now, it's not going to be a lesson in grammar. Don't worry about that. Because again, I couldn't do that. But just, I, I know that you know as well as I do that a noun names something. It indicates the name of something. An adjective, it describes or gives information about the noun. And a verb. What does a verb do? A verb is a doing word. It explains the act of choosing. That which has been named. That which has been described. Has been chosen. And the actual choosing of it. The verb that is used. And that's, that's really where all the controversy. Or most of the controversy. Centres around the verbs. Now. In relation to the noun. On the sheet you'll see that I've said the noun appears seven times in your New Testament. It's translated in your English Bible as election six times and as chosen just one occasion. The noun, that's the verse that we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Knowing your election of God. That's just putting a name on what has taken place. It's called election. Then... The adjective, that describes or gives information about the noun. It appears 23 times in your New Testament. Chosen six times, elect seven times. In other words, that which has been chosen, that to which the, the noun applies, is described. And that adjective is used 23 times. The example I gave you was Romans chapter 8. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? In other words, says the apostle, as he looks at believers, he calls them God's elect. He's using a describing word. He's describing them as elect. Now I'm going to go into the differences and the nuances just a little bit more in a moment. The verb that explains the act of choosing. That which has been named or described. The choice that was made. Who made it? God made it. How did he make it? Well, that's what the verb is going to explain to us. That takes us to Ephesians chapter 1. According as he has chosen us, he hath chosen us. That's the verb, the doing word, in him before the foundation of the word. The verb chosen is used to explain the action of God making the choice. So, if you try and keep those three things in your mind clearly, we'll go down some of the biblical data and see what we can learn. Now the adjective, first thing that a lot of people do is they confuse the adjective with the verb. The adjective is describing that which has been chosen. Describing the quality of it, describing the character of it, describing how God views it, whatever way you want to put it. It describes the quality. Now, a number of references. I'm not sure which ones I have on the handout, but if you follow me, we'll go firstly to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23, verse 35, we're at Calvary. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, 
He saved others. Let him save himself if he be Christ, the chosen of God. That's the adjective. If he be Christ, the chosen of God. What exactly does it mean? Well, it means simply that God made choice of Christ. But these men around the cross, these sinful individuals, they would have known nothing of his choice, of God's choice of Christ in the sense that we would appreciate it. The word here is used, I judge, as in relation to the Messiah, the chosen one by God for the nation. In other words, the crowd are looking and they're saying, if he wants to, I say it reverently, if he wants to describe himself or put himself in the role as the Messiah, the one chosen by God or the choice one, the supremely chosen one, well, say they, if that's what he's going to do, well, let him come down from the cross. Now, in relation to angels, it's also used. The adjective is used to describe angels. 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 1. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels. There's the adjective again. Now, we've had the adjective used to describe Christ. We've had the adjective used, elect, to describe angels. In neither of those two cases, I would know that I don't have to prove to you that in either of those two cases was it used in the sense of electing to salvation. Because Saviour never needed to be saved. And because for angels there's no salvation for them. Fallen angels, for them there is no salvation. It's the elect angels, the choice angels. Remember, it's a descriptive word. If I said to you concerning a certain brother or sister that you know, who is someone who's very active in the assembly, you know the level of their spirituality, you know their godliness, you've seen it for years. If I said to you, that's a choice sister, you would know what I meant, wouldn't you? That's exactly what we're talking about here. Now, Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Verse 24. Speaking of tribulation days, the Saviour said, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. There's the descriptive title again. There's the adjective used to describe who? Those who are saved in tribulation days. Now, it's also used in Romans chapter 8. I quote it to you. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? That's the same descriptive title used of believers in our day, if you like. So, the adjective is used in relation to the person of Christ. It's used in relation to angels. It's used in relation to believers both of this age and of the tribulation age. And it's speaking of their character, of the choiceness of their character, of their top quality, if you like. Really select if you want to bring a homely word. Now lastly in Romans chapter 16. Well, lastly under the, the adjective. Romans chapter 16. I'm just picking out examples of the 23 occurrences in which the adjective is used. Romans chapter 16 and verse 13. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and Maya. That's the adjective again. Now the apostle is not saying that Rufus was chosen to be saved from out of others. He's saying that Rufus is a choice believer. It's the adjective. He's describing the man. He's describing his character. Now notice, when it's used of a Jewish remnant in tribulation days, the elect is speaking of a group of people. When it's used of angels, the elect angels, it's speaking, it's bringing them all together under one title, a group of angels, the elect angels. When it's used of believers, Romans chapter 8, it's bringing all the believers together. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's not speaking about the individual believer. It's speaking about all being brought together. Every soul that's saved is brought together under the title, the elect. Now, have a look at Titus chapter 1. And if you have a Newbury Bible, this will be particularly helpful. If you haven't, I'm sure I could introduce you to somebody who could get one for you. Uh, 
really the Newbury Bible comes into its own in studies like this. Titus chapter 1. And if you don't have a Newbury beside you, try and look on to somebody who has one because this is really invaluable. You need to see this. Titus 1 verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect. Now you're familiar with Newbury symbols if you have the, the Bible in front of you. You'll notice it's plural. Have a look over at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved. Now notice elect. Notice Newbury symbol. It's a plural word. And every occasion in which you find it, or sorry, most occasions in which you find it, certainly on occasions referring to believers, it's usually used as a plural word. The occasions when it's used as a singular is in relation to the person of Christ, because there's only one of him. And when it's used in relation to Rufus in Romans chapter 16, because there's only one of him, there was one individual. But generally speaking, it refers to a group together. The elect is referring not to an individual elected or chosen to be saved. It refers, it's a descriptive title of those as a group who have been saved. Now the noun, it's used seven times. And the noun refers to the, the event. It's the naming word. It puts a name on the event that took place, the event of electing or that which has been chosen. The noun states the fact of election. That's really what it does. It's translated as election six times and as chosen just once. Now, we'll go back to Romans chapter 9. The epistle to the Romans and to chapter 9. Now what I want you to do as we read verse 11, I want you to ask yourself, to whom does it refer and to what does it refer? Chapter 9 verse 11, we're breaking into the middle of the argument, but for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand. Now who's it referring to? It's referring to God's choice of Israel as a nation. Not referring to an individual. God's choice of Israel as a nation. To what does it refer? It is that elect of God's choice. It's referring to God's scheme of election, if you like. The whole plan that God had in raising up a nation for his own name and for his own glory. The nation of Israel. Romans chapter 11 and verse 5. Referring again to the to Jews who have been saved. Even so then at this present time also. There is a remnant. Now notice a remnant. That's a collection of people. A remnant according to the election of grace. That's the noun word. That is a remnant according to the scheme of God's choosing if you like. Or God's plan of grace. If you like to use another expression. Now. When it refers to Israel. It's nothing to do with choosing them. To be saved, it's God's choice as a nation. When it refers to believers, it doesn't give us any hint as to the purpose of the choice. It's just the fact that God's choice has been exercised. It's the label that's put on the scheme of God's plan of salvation, if you like. When you come to 1 Thessalonians 1, where we read in verse 4, you have it referring, obviously, to believers of this age, where the apostle says, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. That's the actual choice by God. Now again, notice, says nothing about what God has chosen them for. It doesn't say whether this is an individual believer or whether it's a group. That's not in question here. It's simply putting the label on it that it's according to God's election. Knowing your election. Says to the apostle as he writes to believers in Thessalonica. I know. Or I have been confirmed. Or it has been confirmed to me. The fact that you have been chosen by God. Now there's nothing more. That you can read into that statement. Unless of course. That you have a particular bias. And desire to do that. Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 10. We're still looking at occurrences of the noun. Which names the act of God choosing. Or the event. Verse 10. Wherefore the rather brethren. Give diligence to make your calling. 
and election sure. Now, if election always refers to God choosing out an individual for salvation, would you tell me how I can make my election sure? If it's election to salvation, it doesn't work at all in this verse. Because a believer cannot make his election sure if it's referring to God's choice for him to be saved. Now, again, in Acts chapter 9, this is the last of the, the nouns. We have covered all seven of them, I think. Acts chapter 9 and verse 15. This is the one occurrence where it's not translated as election. It's translated as chosen. Speaking of Saul of Tarsus, the Lord said, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings. There's the one occurrence where it refers clearly, unmistakably, to an individual. God has made choice in Acts chapter 9 of an individual. On the other occurrences where we read of God making choice, of groups of individuals, either Jewish believers in a day to come, or believers in the day in which we're living, we're not given any indication as to what the choice was to, or what the purpose of God's choice was. It's just that God had chosen them. But here we have the reason given for God's choice. It refers to an individual. He is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name. It's not chosen in relation to salvation. It's chosen in relation to service. And again, keep that in mind, that when you have an individual mentioned, it's not chosen to be saved, but it's chosen to serve. God is saying, I have chosen him to serve me. Now, in the last six minutes, we have to cover the 21 references to the verb, which I, I know we can do. But we're going to the verb, and this really is the one where all the controversy uh, surrounds. If you come to Mark's Gospel, chapter 13. We start in the Gospel of Mark chapter 13. And this will show you the importance of distinguishing. This will show you the importance of the exercise that we have been doing. Distinguishing the various parts of speech that God uses. Chapter 13 and verse 20. Speaking again of tribulation days. And except that the Lord had shortened those days. No flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake. Whom he hath chosen. He hath shortened the days. There are two words that we've been considering in the one sentence. The elect's sake, that's the adjective that we're referring to. That's describing a group of people, the choice ones. Whom he hath chosen. That's how they become elect. He hath chosen. That's the verb. He shortened the days. Now that shows you the importance of distinguishing the various parts of speech because there you have the two in the one verse. Now, 21 occurrences of the verb. And it's around this verb that all the controversy has raged. I'm not going to take time, but I leave it to you to have a look on the sheet. I have documented all the, the references for you. Of those 21 times, four times is a choice made by people. You'll remember Martha and Mary in the house of Bethany. Martha seems to be complaining that Mary is sitting while she's left to do all the work. What did the Lord say? She hath chosen the better part. That's the verb that we're considering. So you'll know that that plus the other three occasions when it's used by people, it's got nothing whatever to do with salvation. It's got nothing whatever to do. So out of the 21, there's four we can eliminate already as nothing to do with salvation. Then there are two when it relates to God's choice of Israel. One of them is in Mark chapter 13. The other is in Acts chapter 13. The elect sake, that's the Jewish remnant whom he hath chosen. Then there are four. We can eliminate, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, you'll get one of them. Just to explain or show the principle. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The word chosen will appear again. And it appears four times. In the same way, nothing whatever to do with our salvation. Or the salvation of the sinner. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 27. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things to confound the things that are mighty. Down again. Verse 28. And the base things of the world and things that are despised hath God chosen. There's the verb. God choosing. And again. 
it's, there are three times out of the 21 that we can rule it out in relation to the actual salvation of an individual. Four, in relation to people choosing. Two, in relation to God choosing Israel, that's six. Another four, where it's God's choice of a principle of operation, if you like. How God is going to operate. He's choosing the weak things to confound the mighty. Four, two, six, four is ten. We're halfway through the list of verbs already that have become such a controversy. When you take the other 20 or the other 11, 10 of them, and again I'll have to ask you to accept what I'm saying here. I have it documented. You can check it out on your own. On 10 occasions, it's God's choice of people, yes, as individuals, but it's always for service. Go to Luke chapter 6. Gospel according to Luke chapter 6. Now the verb choose or chose that we have in verse 13 that we've been looking at, there are 10 occurrences when it appears in exactly the same way as is used here in verse 13. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples. Notice who he called, his disciples. They already are disciples. And of them he chose 12. Now you follow the list that I have given you there from Luke 6 right down to <coughs> Acts 15. Let me check. I think I did give it there. I did, yes. You follow that list and you'll discover that for each one of those ten, it's exactly the same principle. It's God choosing individuals, yes, but for service, not for salvation. These men in Luke's Gospel, chapter 6, are already saved. And the Saviour choosing them has nothing to do with their salvation. So there's four, and two is six, and four is ten, and ten is twenty. We've only one left. And all the controversy, and centuries of debate, and libraries of books, and seminaries have been built around the interpretation of this one word chose. Ephesians chapter 1. So when we say it's a big subject, it is big. But when you analyse it down to its real essence, it's maybe not so big after all. All the controversy surrounds this one verse. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, let's get to the verb if we can in Ephesians chapter 1. When you come to Ephesians chapter 1, you need to read it carefully. And it's elementary, but it needs to be stated. It doesn't say, according as he hath chosen us to be in him. It's not saying that. That's what the Calvinists want to make it say. That's what they do make it say. That's what the Reformed theologians make it say. That it says that he hath chosen us to be in him. In other words, before the foundation of the world, in the eternal counsels, God chose me to be in Christ. So that when the time came that I was born into the world, I was one born on whom God's choice rested to be in Christ. That is not. That is turning Ephesians 1 verse 4 right on its head. What is it saying? Well, before I tell you what it's saying, I want to make one or two general statements. Things that everybody, no matter their, no matter their stance on election, things that everybody will agree about. Romans chapter 11 tells us that election is of grace. The election, uh, sorry, according to the election of grace, Romans 11 makes that clear. Another fundamental statement that is clear from Ephesians chapter 1 is that it's eternal. There are two things about election, about your election and mine, that are clear. It's of grace and it is eternal. Now, however we understand this election, however we understand Ephesians 1 verse 4, there are a number of general principles that I want you to remember. I've documented them on the form. I'll take time just to cover them very quickly. Sovereignty and foreknowledge are equally eternal attributes of God. And because they are eternal, one cannot predate the other. In other words, God didn't foreknow before he chose. God didn't choose before he foreknew. Each one is eternal as God is. Not only do they not predate each other, but neither one is subservient to the other. You see, and the reasons I'm saying this is just in case 
somebody has been reading Reformed theology. The Reformed theologian will tell us that on the basis of God's foreknowledge, foreknowledge he chose. And foreknowledge motivated choice. I want you to understand that foreknowledge and sovereignty are not. They are eternal attributes. Not only are they eternal in the sense of their time. And I know that that's a contradiction because eternity is outside of time. But as far as we're concerned, going as far back as our minds can take us. Before the creation of the world. Foreknowledge and sovereignty existed in full measure in God. Neither one was greater than the other. Each is equally divine as God. God didn't choose based on his foreknowledge. Neither does he know based on his previous choice. Either word, otherwise, someone of the two is not eternal. Otherwise, someone is not an eternal attribute. And sovereignty as an eternal attribute of God cannot work against any other attribute. One attribute of God is not in contradiction of another. And his election as eternal choice cannot deny any of his other attributes. Now, with that in mind, it is quite scriptural, and I know you will agree with me, that man has a free choice. Man has a will to choose. Deuteronomy chapter 30, if we need to confirm it. Deuteronomy chapter 30, this is only one of a number of verses that would be useful. Chapter 30, verse 19. The words of Moses on behalf of the Lord, he said, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. The fact that man has a choice, and not only does he have a choice, but by God he's held responsible for the consequences of that choice. God doesn't force or coerce any man to do anything. God's election doesn't interfere with a man's freedom to choose. And man's freedom to choose doesn't interfere with God's sovereignty and God's election. So those are basic principles. I think I have all of those documented. And I know it will take a wee bit of time for you just to work yourself through them. But those are basic principles that we've got to keep in mind. With that in mind, come again. Ephesians 1 verse 4. According as he hath chosen us in him. Before the foundation of the world. Now Paul is not saying that we existed before the foundation of the world. That is obvious. But what Paul is saying is that before the foundation of the world. God made a plan of salvation if you like. That plan of salvation centered in his son. Who pre-existed with him. And the strategy of God and the plan of salvation was to bless all those who are in Christ. In other words, God made choice of Christ. He is the chosen one, the elect of God. And the plan of God is this. That every person down the ages of time who puts their faith in Christ. Every person who is in Christ is chosen as Christ is. Now. That doesn't deny, by the way, that election is personal. One of the books that I referred to, A Defense of, I forget the exact title, A Defense of Divine Election and Sovereignty or something like that. The author waxes almost hysterical. That somehow or other we have lost a great truth. That God has chosen some kind of a, a non-entity, a vague group of people. Well, I think we need to be clear about this. When God began with mankind, God is going to raise from the fall a nation to his own name and for his own glory. He raised the nation of Israel. And all those in the nation were his chosen people. Each one enjoyed that status, not because of God's individual thoughts towards some particular individual in the tribe, but because God chose Abraham, and in Abraham all who would come from his loins through the son of promise would enjoy the choice that God, or the chosenness that God had made concerning Abraham. When it comes to the New Testament, God has a people. 
God has chosen Christ and all who are in Christ, all who come from that tremendous relationship, they are chosen. You see, how could one become one of the chosen people in the Old Testament? Only one way, by being born into the nation. How can one become one of God's elect in the New Testament? There's only one way, just one way, by new birth, by being born into the family of God. Now that sense of collective identity, that's what, that seems to stall so many otherwise clear thinkers. That God didn't choose me. Well, rather than say God chose me, we should be saying God chose us in Christ. Because that's what the Bible states. And that idea of collective identity, by the way, apparently it's your Bible. One quick example. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The apostle is speaking there about the fall. What does he say? As in Adam all die. Now I wasn't alive when Adam fell in the garden. You'll know that. But when Adam fell. And Romans 5 clarifies this. As Adam fell. All of humanity. All of the race that would flow from his loins. Fell with him. So that sense of collective identity. Is something that's clearly rooted in Holy Scripture. Christ is the head of a new race. And how God views the head of the race, his chosen one, his elect one. How he views and values him is how he views and values every member. And by the way, when it comes to speaking of the blessings and the privileges that are ours as a people of God, God always, almost always, uses a collective identity, the bride. That's not some kind of vague entity. The church. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. The same people who will complain about this, as they call it, vague entity, that they're losing something, are quite happy to accept that Christ loved the church and they revel in it. The body. The vine. So many different metaphors are all used, and every one of them is collective, speaking of the whole aggregate of those who are genuinely saved. When it comes to God's choice, God's choice of individuals refers to service. Otherwise, when you read of God making choice, it's always of a group. And in relation to salvation, it's always God making choice of a group. Not to be saved, but that those who obey God's simple plan of salvation and are saved, they are invested, if you like, with all the chosenness of Christ. In whom they enjoy that position. How do we find ourselves getting into Christ if you like? Only by faith in him.